160. I'll meet you in the morning. All right, where are my loud altos at? All right, got to have some loud altos. Singing this one out here too. Where are my loud altos at? Are they over here? <laughs> All right. All right, give us a little intro, Brother Eddie. I'll meet you in the morning, 160. Oh, 
And uh, we got these fancy mics hanging right here. And we got a new sound console. And I was hearing all those parts, but I don't think they got to hear all the parts because y'all were sitting down. So now we're going to do it with the microphone. Are they on the mics on, Josh? All right, we're going to really hear some parts now. Last verse, here we go. I meet you. Number nine, number nine, the unclouded day. I'm going to zap this one up a little bit too. <clears throat> I like that right there. Number nine. Here we go. Oh, they tell me of the whole body on the skies. So oh, they tell me of the whole body. enjoyed that. Let's see, James, where are you at? There he is over there. James, what was it you said we, you wanted to do the other day? What song was it? 
Amazing Grace, number 228. 228. Everybody turn over there. Tell you what, y'all stand up with us on this lap. 228. Amazing Grace. <clears throat> Sing it tonight. Brother Dodie, could you lead us in prayer right here, please?
side I trust you with my life I know my story It isn't over Even against our odds You are a faithful God You're a faithful God Darkest of together and I will dwell in the hope of your love forever I am convinced that your promises will hold together and I will dwell in your love and I will sing through fire and thunder cause you were on my side I trust you with my life I know my story it isn't over even against all odds you are a faithful God that's who you are you are a faithful God oh you're faithful God Excellent job. I appreciate them singing tonight. If you want to turn in your Bibles, and some uh, give out the sheets for the kids tonight. Can I have, is there an extra one of those? You want a color too? I don't need colors. I just need sheets. <laughs> All right, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we're going to pick up reading in uh, verse 19. As they give those out. Uh, how many of just by chance, and this is just so I kind of know the feel of the room, how many were able to be in Sunday school this morning? Okay, all right. So uh, many of you had some form of this lesson, adult wise, you had some form of this lesson this morning. Um, so for some of you, it may be a little bit of a refresher, but hopefully it's going to be kind of thought of maybe in a different way. Uh, I did share with uh, the adult Sunday school teachers the, the questions that I was using in our class today. And uh, so you may hear some of the same, but, but maybe the thoughts around them will be a little bit different. But we're going to look at a, a subject matter maybe that's not always easy to discuss or talk about. Uh, I want to start reading in Romans. If you were in Sunday school this morning, you went back and you actually started in Genesis uh, chapter 19. You read the story of uh, Lot with Sodom and Gomorrah and, uh, and the events that happened there. I'm trusting maybe that you know some of that story as a background to what we're going to be talking about here tonight. So uh, let's start reading in Romans chapter 1. 
And let's start in actually in verse 18 instead of 19. Let's back up to there. Verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, something before we go any further than that verse is I want us to, to take note of what God's wrath is revealed against. And if you'll take note there, it says, All ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men. This is not looking at one particular sin and saying God's wrath is poured out upon this one particular sin. This is saying God's wrath is poured out upon all unrighteousness that mankind has. Now, every one of us, no matter who we are, no matter what age we are, unless we fall under the age of accountability, uh, but no matter who we are, we are all sinners by nature. Which means we are all on the same playing field. Okay? So I want us to kind of have that background as we go forward in our discussion tonight. Verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, if you will flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, very next book in your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's read a few verses from there and then we'll get into some discussion. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's start in verse 9. First Corinthians 6 9 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. I want you to kind of think on that last verse for just a moment. And such were some of you. But you didn't stay there. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. Not by your own actions, not by any good deed that you've done, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Okay? It's interesting when we take note um, in church life, and, and I'm going to make this statement, and I trust that you will do this. 
If I say anything tonight that you have question about or you would like to talk about, I trust that you will come talk to me about it. You will not get upset and walk out and say, you shouldn't have said that, or I don't understand what he's talking about, or that's just not right. I trust that you will come talk to me about it, whatever it might be, okay? And that goes for any time that we have service or any time that I teach. I hope that you will do that because I want us to have open dialogue about God's Word. There are times that I may have it wrong, and I need you to, to, to help me grow and learn in it as well. So I trust that you will do that. We are here as a body of people that are trying to learn, and we want to learn together, okay? So let's be friends and learn together. Tonight when we look at, at these passages of text, there are certain things out of these passages of text that we have touched on much harder than we have others. Many of you probably know what I'm already talking about. And we touch on homosexuality much harder than we do some of the other things that have been named here. And part of the reason that we do that, and I, I use this term, I, I don't know how else to say it, so I'm just going to use the term, and I don't mean it derogatory. I just mean that this is the only way I know how to explain it. I think part of the reason that we touch on that more than we do others is because we think that's more gross than anything else. I do not mean that derogatory toward anyone. So if there's someone listening online, I don't mean it bad. I just don't know how else to explain that. Reality of what Scripture says is that God's wrath is poured out on all unrighteousness. That unrighteousness can be that we lie and we are a compulsive liar and that's all that we know to do. That wrath can be poured out on someone that is a gossip and, and that's what engulfs most of their life. That wrath can be on someone that is homosexual, homosexual and has not repented in the same way that a gossip or a liar is not. That wrath can pour out upon that. Okay? What I want us to know tonight is that God's wrath is poured out upon all unrighteousness. Not just certain things more than others. And we would do well if we truly want to reach those in our community, society, and the world that are struggling and have not given their life to Christ, or maybe they have but they're struggling in some way with sin, if we want to truly reach them, we would do well to understand that sin is sin. And every one of us are sinners by nature. And it is only through the blood of Christ that we have been redeemed. Absolutely. When we have that understanding within our mind, then we have to know that we are all on the same playing field. And the sin that I may struggle with, even as a born-again believer, because I hope all of you will be honest tonight. Even as a born again believer, there are still sins that we will struggle with. We are not perfect after that. So the sin that I may struggle with may be different than the sin that you will struggle with or someone else will struggle with. Someone that has struggled with homosexuality, I'm just going to use that as an example, just because they become saved, and I'm not saying God can't do this, but I am saying that there is a chance that they may still struggle with that sin even after being saved. Someone that is a habitual liar from the time that they could first speak their first word. Because we've known people like that, right? That even as a kid they would rather tell you a lie than tell you the truth. People like that, sometimes God totally removes that and they are truthful from that point on. There's a total change that, that just overtakes it. Sometimes they still struggle with that sin. I think it's God's way of keeping us humble. And sometimes they struggle with that the rest of their life. And they constantly have to go back to God and say, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. Help me to be better. Okay? But, but here's what I want us to understand. is someone that has been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ has a desire to turn away from whatever it is. Now, as church people... 
We have been our own worst enemy at times at trying to reach those who are unsaved or those who are dealing with certain sins. For one reason, we've maybe been afraid to even go talk to them, whoever they are. And we hide behind, as I kind of spoke about this this morning, we sometimes hide behind certain excuses. And I told you this morning, just tell me you're out of peanut butter. Don't try to sugarcoat it with some other excuse. Just tell me you're out of peanut butter. If we have a hope, because here's what I want us to go back and think through in our mind. Out of everything that we read about Jesus Christ, was there a group of people that Jesus said, when talking with His apostles, was there a group of people that He said, hey guys, we can't go to them because I'm afraid to talk to them about their life. Christ never said that. So if we want to be Christ-like, we somehow have to find a way to go and talk in the highways and the byways. But, but when I say that, please understand, that means to all people who are dealing with all kinds of sin. Amen. It doesn't matter what it is. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes that's hard. Because there's questions that, that I've been asked that I don't know the answers to, or I have to go dig for the answers to. And sometimes you feel like if you have to go dig for it, people think you're weak and you just don't know much about the faith you believe in. But folks, there's, there's times that questions come up and I've never even thought of it. And no one's ever spoke about it that I've heard before. And yet, people that are struggling or wanting to know truth, it's something that's come up. We can't be afraid to have the conversation just because we may not have the answer. I wanted to do this tonight, and, and uh, since you're comfortable raising your hand, because you've done it earlier, at least those that were in Sunday school, I want to ask you tonight, if someone wants to walk in our church tonight, and they openly admitted that I have a problem with gossip and I need someone to talk to about it. Just by a show of hands, how many of you would be willing to take them into a classroom office, say whatever it is, sit down with them and say, listen, let me help you work through this issue that you have come to a realization that you're dealing with. How many of you would be willing to go into a classroom and talk with them about it? Y'all can raise them high. You don't have to. Okay. All right. Thank you for being honest. So let's say that someone walked in and they said, you know, I, I'm struggling with lying. Lying is something that it's just been, I've, I've seen it in my life. Maybe my parents, maybe this was something that I just learned. I was around people that did it all the time. It's just something that I grew up with and I don't know anything different. But I've realized now that it's wrong and, and I need help working through it. How many of you would be willing to go into a classroom with that individual and say, let me sit down and let's walk through Scripture together. Let me help you figure out how you can try and turn away from that sin. How many would be willing to walk into a class and do that? Okay. Let's say someone walks in and, and they say, you know, alcohol has been a part of my life. I realize that, that I've actually been, I fall into the class of, of drunkenness that's called out here in the Bible, okay? We see that, right? Drunkenness actually is identified as a sin. So they walk in and they say, you know, I realize that, that I've been dealing with drunkenness and I want to change and I need someone to help me with that. How many of you would be willing to walk into a classroom with them and sit down and say, I'll, I'll help you walk through Scripture with this on how to turn away from alcohol? Y'all don't get lazy on me. You tell me, tell me if you will. Okay. Let's say that someone walks in tonight and they say, because you probably figured out where I'm going with this. They walk in and they say, I've been dealing with the sin is homosexuality. And I know what God's Word says. And I know that I need to turn away from it. But I've tried on my own. I can't. I, it, it just keeps coming back. And it keeps coming back. And I need someone to talk to you. How many of you would be willing to walk into a room and talk with someone as a friend, as a brother or sister, 
that wants to help them change, how many of you be willing to walk in that classroom and say, I'm going to walk with you through this with Scripture? I hope you're honest about that. Because that's what needs to happen today. And I'm going to tell you that they're not always going to walk in this church and say, I need help. Because sometimes we have to become friends with them. And when I say them, please understand, I'm not classifying them in a separate category. I'm just saying, no matter what sin it is, sometimes we have to become friends with those who are struggling with sin. Take away the names of the sin for a moment. We have to become friends with them. We have to earn their trust in order to be able to visit with them about what Scripture says and talk to them about it. I'm going to tell you, this has been a journey for me. I'm just going to get personal with you for a while. Because when I, many of you are my age or older, and, and when I grew up, this was a taboo subject. Right? Like when it, if it came up in high school, it got quietened down pretty quickly and not in the best of ways. It was not nice, and it was not kind, and it was not right. And I'm not trying to make excuses for it. That's just what happened. So I had a, um, I went, most of you know, went to Bay High School, graduated with 42, I think it was, in the class. Um, there was one guy in the class that from about second or third grade, he had somewhat of a, um, and I, I'm just trying to describe, so please don't, don't judge me on how I'm trying to explain this, okay? But he had a, a feminine type of personality. Uh, recess, he ended up playing with Barbie dolls with the girls. Second, third grade, we didn't really think about it that much, you know. He gets on up to, to junior high and people are saying things they shouldn't say. Uh, he ends up dating girls. So everybody kind of thinks, oh, you know, it's, everything's fine. He and I become friends. I spent the night at his house. He spent the night, I don't know if he ever spent the night at mine, but I spent the night at his house. He came to church with me. Uh, we would spend the night, Saturday night. I'd tell him, if I'm staying with you, we got to get up and go to church. And, and we did. I'm not saying I was a perfect influence. I just knew I had to be in church because mom and dad was going to track me down if I wasn't there. Um, so, um, graduate high school. Uh, we hang around together for, I don't know, eight, nine months, you know, high school and then afterwards for a little while. I get into college and end up meeting this wonderful, wonderful person that I've been able to spend 31 years with now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, but anyway, you know, when you meet that person, you... Your friends kind of shift a little bit. Not that you don't like your friends anymore, but you just hang around with the one you enjoy hanging around with, right? And so I didn't see him very much. And and so we kind of grew apart a little bit, still kind of stayed in touch. But it came, came time for us to get married. And so um, I'm, <laughs> she knew who all her bridesmaids were. I had no idea. So I'm calling people that will just be willing to be a groomsman at this point. Because my, my brother kind of had to. That was a blood obligation. But after that, it was kind of iffy. And so I, he was kind of one of my friends. And, and so I called him and I said, hey, would you, would you be a groom? And he was happy to do it. I hadn't seen him in a long time. I didn't know really kind of where his life was at that point in time. And so uh, he agreed. He shows up for rehearsal. He'd let his hair grow out. And I, I mean, I kind of thought about it. didn't think about it much. Like, you know, you have those thoughts from your past. And, and you can't help, but they're thoughts from your past. But I didn't think about it too much. And, and so we have the wedding, and a couple months maybe go by, and I get a phone call from him. And he says, hey, you know, there's, uh, there's some of us that graduated together are getting together on Friday or Saturday night. I don't remember which one it was. He said, we'd like to know if you and Jennifer want to come. It's going to be at, at my house. And I didn't think anything about it. I knew he had a house that he was renting. I didn't think about it, though. And, and uh, I said, sure. You know, and it was some of the people that I'd hung around with. Uh, in high school, hung around with about everybody. It's only 42 of us. <laughs> I mean, you kind of hang around. But so we go, and we get there, and I notice there's this guy there that I don't recognize. He didn't graduate with us. 
I didn't think anything about it. I'm naive at that point. And, um, and so we're there for, I don't know how long, 15, 20, 30 minutes maybe, and, and one of my classmates pulled me into the kitchen. Um, and um, she said, uh, you don't know what this is, do you? And I said, some of us graduated getting together. And I just thought it was kind of friends getting together. She said, this is uh, his coming out party. And I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm not proud of it. I did not react well. And I'm admitting, I've admitted it to some other people before, I did not react well. I looked at Jennifer and I said, you get your stuff and we're going home. And I'm ashamed to say this, but it's just reality. And I told her all the way home, I said, when we get home, you're putting your clothes in the washing machine and we're taking a shower. I'm not proud of that. I was wrong. I know it was wrong. I've asked for forgiveness of that. So I reached out to my pastor. This is a point in time where my pastor did not give me good counsel. I'm not blaming him. I don't, he grew up in the same time period I did. It just wasn't good counsel. He said, you got to call him and you got to tell him that if he will not turn away from that, then you've got to disassociate yourself from him. Trust in what I'm hearing. I call him. I walk to him through passages of text, some that we read tonight. And, uh, and I said, you know, if, if you can't turn away from this, then, then I can't be your friend anymore. Here's what I want you to think about. I was friends with people that were liars. I was friends with people that were alcoholics. I was friends with people that gossiped. You go down the list and you name every other sin and I was friends with them. But for some reason I couldn't be friends with a guy that struggled with homosexuality. And I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's what happened. I was wrong. But I'm afraid I'm not the only person in this world that has been in that spot. I'm afraid, and I'm not saying every single church, but I'm saying there's a percentage of people in churches that have reacted in the exact same way as I did. And that's not right. <clears throat> Um, his mom died. I went to her funeral or visitation. I don't think I got to go to the funeral for some reason. It was during the day I was working. I went to her visitation. Uh, he was there. Uh, we kept our distance. We didn't talk. I talked to his brother, but, but we didn't talk. Several years went by. I, after I grew in my relationship with God, um, I become burdened about. It. I reached out to him on Facebook, and um, and I apologized. I, I told him I, I still believe that that is sin, and I believe that it's wrong. But I have sin in my life too that I know is wrong. But I want you to know that I reacted the wrong way, and I hope you'll forgive me. And he did. And uh, the last statement that we have was, you know, if he ever makes it back to town, we'd like to maybe eat lunch together. That hasn't happened. I don't know if it ever will. I don't know if he's ever come back. But um, it probably still wouldn't be the same because I broke the relationship. When we think about dealing with individuals in this world who are hurting because they're dealing with sin. If we truly want to be Christ to them or a representation of Christ to them, we can't break the relationship. That doesn't mean that we agree with what they're doing. Christ met with people all the time that he did not agree with what they were doing, but he still met with them. You think about Peter. How many times did Peter fail? <laughs> And yet Christ said, you're one of the apostles. 
And he went back to him and he restored him. Now, was Peter trying? I do believe Peter was trying, right? I get that. I do want us to realize that there is a difference in, in some things as we, we think about what we've read here tonight. Um, one of those differences is when we're dealing with Christians who are dealing with sin, that is a different conversation than when we're dealing with someone who is not a professing follower of Christ. When we're dealing with someone that's not a professing follower of Christ, the most important thing is that they understand that they are a sinner just like you and I and that they need Jesus Christ to be their Savior because there's a debt they can't pay and Christ is the only one that can pay it. We can't get more deep into what the sins are. We have to first get to the point where they understand that they need a Savior. After that... And they make that profession of faith in Christ. And they say that I want to follow Christ. At that point, we start talking about what the sins are and how can we turn away from them. And what does Scripture say about them? And how can I help you turn away from them? And we start dealing with things after that. But the first thing we got to deal with is Christ. And it doesn't matter who they are, what sin they're involved in. They just do not know Christ. And it's no different than one of your children that turns, and I'm just making up some numbers here, but they turn 15 and they suddenly realize that they need a Savior, that they're not saved, and that they have committed sin, and they need to turn to Christ. It's no different than that individual, even though they're not dealing maybe with the same sin. It's still separation from God. And they need to know that Christ died for them. It's a different conversation. And somehow we have to care enough to figure out which one of those two categories people fit in. Which means we have to devote enough time to them to get down to the root of, have you ever truly accepted Christ as your Savior? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Christ? Because if they don't believe in Him, it does you no good to even talk about gossip or lying or homosexuality or whatever other sin you want to throw in there. Because if they don't believe in God, then what basis do they have for you to talk to them about turning away from it according to the Bible? Because they don't believe in anything that's here. I want to ask, um, because there's a question we kind of got to in class. Um, actually, the very first question I threw out to Adam was, uh, what are some sins that exist in our culture today? And they all looked at me just like you are. Because isn't it pretty much every sin exists in our culture today? Like, do you know of a sin that no longer exists here anymore? Some might say, well, idolatry. We don't have an idol set up down on the town square. Yeah, we do. We've got idols all over the place in our lives. We just don't realize what they are. One of them is probably sitting in your living room, and it's plugged into your electrical outlet, and you can watch... It hurts me to say it, but you can watch Andy Griffith on it if you're not careful. <laughs> we have idols all over the place. There's not a sin that's called out in the Bible that we're not dealing with in culture today. So why do we focus more on some than others? I want to go back. We didn't read the story of Lot, and this got brought up to me after um, after class today. It's not one of the questions that I had on the list, and maybe some of you covered it in class. I, it just never occurred to me until um, uh, Justin actually brought it up to me, and I appreciate him doing that because I didn't think of it. When you look at Lot, and, and one of the questions I asked was, like, what surprises us about some of Lot's actions? And, and one of the things we talked about was that Lot offered his daughters. Like he said, you know, leave these angels, we know them to be, but leave these angels alone. But here, take my daughters. Go do with them. You know the story, right? 
Now, I know it's a different culture then. It's not the same as today. But, but still, Lot offers his daughters. And I think I even said, or maybe someone in class said, we wouldn't dream of doing that today. I think I may have said that. And Justin come to me, and, and, and in the course of conversation, there's a light bulb that went off in my life, and he already realized it, I think. But there's a light bulb that went off in my life. We actually are doing that. Think about some of the beauty pageants that kids dress up for or dress down for. And I understand that we're not throwing them out there and telling guys to go have sex with them. Please excuse my language. I know we got kids in here. I'm just trying to make the point. But we're throwing them out there and we're letting people gawk over them and we're letting people look at them in ways that they should not look at them. Are we not doing the same thing that Lot did? And should we not be ashamed? Now, I understand that individually some of you may not be doing that. So I'm not trying to like cast a stone on you or say anything like that. I'm just saying as a culture, it's happening. Not in the same way, but it's happening. You turn your TV on and you'll see it. And there are people that are celebrating it because their daughter or, or, or wife or whatever, they think they look really nice. And they're throwing them out there for everybody to look over, and I'm going to say it, to lust over as well. It's not right. <clears throat> we didn't get to it in our class today. I want to um, I want to finish with it uh, tonight because it is really kind of what we handed out to your kids tonight. Um, in John chapter 13, verse 34, 35, you, you probably know this. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I, uh, I know there's, there's background information before these verses. I know that. I do want us to acknowledge, though, that Christ does not say, when you've turned away from every sin in your life, I will love you. And he doesn't say that when the people around you turn away from every sin in their life, then you can love them. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you are to love one another. Now I know he's talking to a, we would believe at this point that he's probably talking to a, what we might term a saved audience or those who are following him at this point. But we got to believe that those who are following him are not without sin. Peter is among the group. There's sin going on in there. And I'm not trying to throw Peter under the bus. He's just the example we have. When we look at, and, and <clears throat> when we look at, at what God defines, and if you go back into the beginnings of Genesis, you, you find that God's original design was for husband and wife, man and woman to be together, to be married for life. Um, we've messed that up in a lot of ways. And it's not just homosexuality. We have adultery that goes on. Why do we focus on one more than the other? some questions that you kids have to work through. I'm going to let them work through that. I'm not going to go through that. Um, I think those between you and them, they can answer them. I would uh, want us to close in prayer tonight, though. And, and um, again, I, if you have any questions about what we've talked about tonight, 
if you have any concerns, if you think that I'm way off my rocker and I've lost it, um, I, I want to have that conversation with you. I want to work through whatever it may be. So please come talk to me about that. Because uh, I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and say I have everything figured out. I don't. Um, but I would ask that we pray together tonight that as a church that we would realize that every single person on the face of this earth have been born in the image of God, created in the image of God. Amen. Due to sin that entered the world back with Adam and Eve, we all have a sin nature. And sometimes that sin nature looks different in one person than it does in another. But I would hope as a church that we would extend open arms, not that we condone sin, because we should never condone, I don't care what kind of sin it is, we should never condone it. But I would hope that we would extend with open arms grace that God has shown to us, to every person on the face of the earth. And that we would welcome them in, and we would be willing to walk into the classroom and sit down with them with a Bible or, or just conversation and develop a relationship where we can talk with them. And that relationship may take two years before you get a chance to actually visit with them about the sin that's going on in their life. But you care enough, we care as a church, we care enough. That we're concerned about them, about their home and where that final home will be. And because of that, we're willing to devote as much time as it takes to visit with them about where their life is and their belief in God or their lack of belief in God or, or wherever it may be with the hopes that we have the chance to share with them about the love of Jesus Christ. But if we're ever going to have the chance to share with them about the love of Christ, we've got to show them the love of Christ. So would you stand with me tonight and be willing to pray that some form of that prayer that you're willing to show the love of Christ in whatever way that may look as you interact with people around you. No matter what their sin may be, no matter what the conversation may be that you have to have. Would you pray that with me tonight? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you this evening, Lord, wishing that we had all the wisdom that we need to handle every situation that we seem to encounter. Lord, I know if we had it all, we would become prideful. And so I pray that you give us the wisdom that we need in the times that we need it so that we learn to rely upon you and your timing as we interact with those around us. But Lord, I pray that we would welcome those around us no matter what is going on in their life with the open arms that you've welcomed us with when we first began inquiring about who you are. Lord, I pray that if we've had actions or, or conversations or language with someone in the past that we should not have had, I pray that we seek reconciliation, that we seek forgiveness. Not saying, Lord, that we want to acknowledge that, that sin is, is okay and sin is correct. I'm just saying that we would acknowledge our wrongness and maybe the way we've reacted toward others. Lord, I'm thankful that we have the example written for us of your son's love for all people. Because Lord, we need that example and we need to be reminded of it. I need to be reminded of it. 
So I pray, Lord, that your spirit would remind me daily of the love that you've shown toward me, the love that you have toward me, and the love that you have toward every person that has been created in your image. Help us to be the church that reaches beyond the walls into our community. And Lord, to the people that, that are searching for hope, that are lost, that have a void in their life that they don't know how to fill and they've turned to everything else but you. And Lord, help us be the messenger that reveals them to you or reveals you to them. Help us to show your love. And I pray this in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen.